Wait, I thought they said it couldn't be climbed in the mud. But they climbed it anyway. Wow, impressive. Yeah. But then what happened? They were attacked and climbed back down. Wow. Well, that was always a possibility. Okay. October 23rd, 1942. Since the wildly successful Axis offensive in June, the North African Front has stabilized at El Alamein. But that may soon change. For this week, the big Allied offensive there finally kicks off. The Second Battle of El Alamein. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Axis restarted their offensive in the mountains of the Caucasus, and in the second half of the week, all hell broke loose in Stalingrad. The Japanese lost the naval battle of Cape Esperance, yet they still landed thousands of men on Guadalcanal and pounded the American positions there. However, the battle of material attrition in the Solomons was drawing in the Japanese ships, men, and aircraft at a rate they could not afford to continue for much longer. It was precisely the kind of campaign Imperial General Staff had planned to avoid because it reduced their ability to fortify their Pacific defensive perimeter. On the 18th, Bull Halsey takes over Allied South Pacific Naval Command from Robert Gormley. His naval strength is Battleship Washington and her task force, Norman Scott's cruisers, and the carrier Hornet and her task force. But lo and behold, today the 23rd, the carrier Enterprise, Halsey's flagship, her task force, and the new battleship South Dakota pull into Noumea. Tomorrow, President Franklin Roosevelt will direct the Joint Chiefs to make sure that every possible weapon gets through to that area to hold Guadalcanal. On Guadalcanal, the Japanese are now 20,000 strong and begin new attacks. Tadashi Sumiyoshi, with his force of some 3,000 men or so, is to make probing attacks across the Matanikau River, designed to draw off American troops from their southern perimeter, where Harukichi Hayakutaki is going to make the main attack, which is set first for the 22nd, but then moved to the 23rd, since the jungle isn't cooperating with getting the heavy guns into position. Then he asks for another 24-hour delay. Combined Fleet Commander Isoroku Yamamoto by this time is getting annoyed because his blockading fleet units are running low on fuel, but he agrees to it. Then signals get crossed, and Japanese command at Rabaul does not pass on the second postponement to Sumiyashi. So his force attacks tonight all by itself, across the Matanikau with light tanks and infantry, and it does not go well. The Marines are expecting something like this and blow up the tanks with 37mm anti-tank guns. And the attack turns into a series of suicidal charges that are just mowed down with machine guns. Well, this seriously blunts the plan for Hayakutaki's main attack, but it is still scheduled for tomorrow night. There is also action on the Kokoda Trail this week. Strong Japanese resistance holds back the Australians on the trail at Eor Creek the 17th. The Australian 16th Brigade is now leading the advance, having taken over from the 25th. On the 21st, the Australians have closed with the main Japanese AOR positions. The Japanese have been slowed by supply and terrain issues. Supply and terrain are, of course, huge issues in other theaters of the war as well, notably the Mediterranean and North Africa. Axis U-boats are operating off the coast of Morocco and Gibraltar. But they are busy hunting convoy SL-125 and do not spot all of the transports bringing the Allied troops to North Africa for Operation Torch. Even into next week, they still can't guess what's up. And what Torch is to be is Allied landings to seize Vichy French North Africa, scheduled for early November. Today, American General Mark Clark lands in Algeria to meet French General Charles Mast and American diplomat Robert Murphy. Murphy has been meeting with French leaders in both Morocco and Algiers. Mast and Antoine Betoir are respective chiefs of staff in Algiers and Casablanca and are the main supporters of the Allied cause here. The French admirals, though, are not aware of the plans, having been strongly anti-British since the British attacks on the French Navy at Marcel Kabir and Dakar in the summer of 1940. The meeting now is to make sure Mast will accept the authority of Henri Giraud, soon to be smuggled out of Vichy, France. Mast agrees to this. 
torch isn't the only thing being built up in the region. We've seen that Bernard Montgomery has been building up the British Eighth Army in North Africa for his offensive against the Axis forces there. The Axis under Irvin Rommel last attacked with the full moon at the end of August, and Montgomery has also been waiting for a full moon for his attack. The moon is totally full at 7.11 a.m. tomorrow morning. But Monty attacks this week, today actually, the 23rd. Now he's considered several plans, throwing out the last one back on the 6th, because he thought it required too many formation tasks for what is not a fully trained desert army. His next plan after that is in fact the one he puts now into action. He will deceive the enemy into thinking the attack is another swing from the south, something both sides have done, by 13th Corps. Monty attacks just before midnight, and his units have been training in night fighting and clearing mines. The minefields are deep and are affectionately called the Devil's Garden. Here is Stephen Sears' description of them. Most of the mines in the Devil's Garden were the anti-tank type, set to go up under the weight of a vehicle or running man. They would destroy any truck that ran over them and cripple tanks by blowing off their tracks. Thickly sown among these large mines were thousands of small S mines, deadly to infantry. If stepped on, a charge shot them two or three feet into the air where they exploded. Many mines were cunningly booby-trapped so that if they were moved, they set off other mines nearby. Stretched just above the ground were trip wires attached to the firing pins of 250-pound aircraft bombs. 30th Corps Infantry, four divisions strong, plans to push through the minefields and savage the Axis infantry, and two armored divisions of 10th Corps will then come in and hold the breach and cover the flanks while the gap widens. 8th Army has the advantage in men, armor, and artillery of about two to one, and a lot more aerial support. Furthermore, the German armor is so short of fuel that it's been split into two groups, for if it were concentrated in one, it might not have enough fuel to make it to wherever the Allies are to attack. The key for Montgomery is to destroy the infantry that holds the Axis defenses together. This is different from earlier strategies. Hitherto, the policy of both sides had been to destroy the enemy's armor first and then his infantry, an unsound practice in Montgomery's opinion in view of the German superiority in mobile warfare. He believed the way to defeat Rommel was again to force him to weaken himself in attacks against the British armor, securely established on ground of his, Montgomery's choice, while 30th Corps set about the systematic destruction of the enemy infantry and thus removed the backbone of the Axis army, hence driving a hole right through the enemy positions. Because if Rommel doesn't want his infantry to be destroyed, he'll have to commit his armor, attacking the shield of the British armor across his own minefields. While that's going on, of course, 30th Corps would be screened and could go about its infantry destroying business. The choice of enemy sector was made thinking an Italian front would likely crumble quicker than a German one. And a side note here, Rommel is not actually in North Africa at the moment. He is in Germany because of illness and exhaustion. Georg Stumme commands in his absence. Monty has been very good with deception so that the Axis would not expect the attack in the North. You have to build up forces for a big offensive, right? Well, they've had fake vehicles and fake buildings in the northern sector for so long that the enemy thinks that's just how it always is there. And then pretty much overnight, replace them with the real thing so no sudden concentration of men or material is spotted by enemy recon. In the south, they do the opposite, suddenly building a fake pipeline and showing new concentrations of troops that can be seen from the enemy high ground at Himaimat. At 9.40 p.m., 882 field guns begin their bombardment, and at 10 p.m., the infantry sets off. 13th Corps' diversionary attack does indeed tie the 21st Panzer Division down in the south, and the main attack hits the Italian Trento Division and the German 164th, who are backed by the Littorio and 15th Panzer Divisions. Four divisions of 30th Corps try to break into the enemy on an 11-kilometer front. Four hours after their start, 600 tanks of 10th Corps will advance in their two columns, clearing the rest of the mines as they go. The Desert Air Force has superiority in the skies, and Montgomery has set up headquarters at El Alamein and issues his orders as the battle begins. At any and all costs, the battle must keep moving and the initiative be kept. 
period. Well, lots of orders going out. On the 18th, I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, but that is the day that Hitler's commando order comes out officially, the order to shoot all captured commandos on site. Last week, as we saw, Hitler issued Operationsbefehl number one, which stopped all German offensive operations except Stalingrad and the Caucasus. Chief of Staff Kurt Zeitzler elaborates on that order today with his compliment to it, stressing that the Soviets were in no position to mount a major offensive with any far-reaching objective. As I mentioned last month though, Soviet commander Georgi Zhukov does believe that the Red Army can mount such an offensive, one against the forces attacking Stalingrad, but it will take time to put it together until at least November. They just have to hold the city until that time. By now, what has become Operation Uranus has become to assume its final form. More on that in the coming weeks. In the Caucasus, back on the 14th, Richard Ruoff kicked off an Axis offensive with all three corps in his 17th Army. The goal is two opposite, and for a few days they did push back the Soviet defenders, but rains begin this week on the 18th, and the mountain trails turn into mud and are impassable. Impassable? Well, not entirely. Three battalions of Gebirgsjäger Regiment 98 managed to push on and on the 22nd capture Mount Samashko, from whose summit they can see the Black Sea in the distance. Counterattacks, though, inflict a lot of casualties, and the front stabilizes once more. As for Stalingrad and its defenders and attackers, Ivan Lyudnikov's 138th Rifle Division has crossed the Volga in force, and as the week begins, they are getting into position at Barikadi, behind the factory and towards the river. Leonte Gurtiev's 308th is in the factory itself and the worker settlement. The German attack hits them hard, driving south from the tractor plant and along the Volga. Dive bombers and fighter bombers create a literal wall of fire sweeping towards the Soviet positions. In fact, on the 17th, the entire perimeter of Soviet 62nd Army is under fire. Those men still surrounded in the north face machine gunners that break into the southern part of Spartanovka. The main battle, though, now that the fight for the tractor plant is over, is for the Red October Krasny Oktyabr factory. The initial assaults are repulsed this day, but towards Barakadi, German troops break a gap between the 138th and 308th along the railway line. They reach the northwest corner of Barakadi, and 62nd Army Commander Vasily Chuikov sends Lyudnikov his orders. You are personally responsible for closing the breach with 308th Rifle Division securing its right flank, establishing close contact. Under no circumstances will you permit enemy penetration of Barakadi factory area and at the junction of 308. You are responsible for the junction. By the evening of the 18th, after literally fighting meter by meter along the railway, the Germans threatened Barakadi from the west. In the north, however, the German machine gunners have been killed to the last man and the immediate Spartanovka threat has passed for the moment. On the 19th and 20th come more attacks on Spartanovka, Barakadi, and Krasny Oktyabr as German reinforcements reach the city. Chuikov's officers rake through all the rear detachments of 62nd Army on the eastern bank, trying to find more men for the rifle companies on the western bank. Still, the bridgehead shrank, meter by meter. Although a wholesale German breakthrough to the Volga was still held in check, Chuikov 62nd had taken fearful punishment between the 14th and 19th of October, and the depth of the Soviet bridgehead on the western bank in Stalingrad now reached little more than 1,000 yards. Still, early in the morning of the 19th, the Soviet 339th Regiment charges and surprises the Germans, retaking three factory workshops. They can't hold them for long, and most of the men are wiped out, but they have bought time for their comrades. As Vasily Grossman said, only in Stalingrad do men know what a kilometer means. It means 1,000 meters, 100,000 centimeters. Now reinforced, strong German attacks begin the 21st against Krasny Oktyabr a bit further south by 79th Infantry supported by tanks and dive bombers. They move along the factory railway line, and by this evening, some units have penetrated the northwest of the factory. The Germans had expected to be through Barricade already the 19th, though. But by the end of the week, 
pretty much everybody there on both sides is dug in, especially at the southwest of the factory. Something interesting Michael Jones writes about. The 79th Division, attacking Krasny Oktyabr, is 6th Army Commander Friedrich Paulus's last fresh division. Why did he not throw it in last week? Chuikov was worried last week that he would do so and believed that if that had happened, he would likely have been overrun. Had Paulus thrown in the new division into the battle raging for the tractor factory, there is a high probability that victory would have been his in October 1942. Chuikov had known it, but the German commander's cautious and methodical approach dictated that reserves should be held back and that these fresh troops should then be used to consolidate the position after the tractor factory and barricade had been reduced. Such a systematic way of thinking has its strengths. Here, it resulted in delay until the moment of truth had already passed. Both south and north of the city, the Soviets are also attacking to try to relieve the pressure. On the 22nd, 64th Army's right flank attacks to the northwest, heading out onto the steppe. They are met by a strong counterattack, and when the Germans bring up reinforcements by night, they are pushed back to their starting points. Konstantin Rokossovsky is attacking from the north with the 24th and 66th Armies, but they too fail to make any headway. And with the first snowfall at Stalingrad, well, yesterday, that ends the week. A week of crossed signals for the Japanese, a new Allied offensive in North Africa, and fighting in stops and starts in Stalingrad and the Caucasus. Oh, and in Burma, the 14th Indian Division is advancing into the Arakan, and they are ordered to reach a line between Ratadang and Butadang before December to prepare for more operations towards Akyab. On the 23rd, forward units at Butadang skirmish with the Japanese who hold the position. Hard to say whether that reserve division would have won the city of Stalingrad had Paulus thrown them in. I mean, nothing else they've thrown in has done it. And the Germans have thought week after week and offensive after offensive that this one was the one. But it's hard to blame Paulus for not changing tactics. I mean, a set city battle like this is the diametric opposite of traditional German warfare. He didn't train for that. The infantry didn't train for that. The tanks didn't train for that. None of them trained for that. And yet they are gambling the whole army on being great at it. Big gamble. If you'd like to learn a bit more about Zhukov, we did a bio special on him. Well, part one of a bio special a while back. And you can check that out right here. Our Time Ghost Army Member of the Week is Vebjorn Kvanli. That's a cool name, right? Vebjorn and Conley. Well, the army is what finances all of our productions. And you may have noticed these episodes are getting longer and longer. So the army have been a big help with being able to pay for the extra footage and the extra editing. You can join the army at timegoes.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.